Pond again. I wanted to get um, Stuart back to talk a little bit about um, how it is that resistance develops, how when we use these um, antimicrobials, um, the way we use them affects you know, the development of resistant bacteria within hospitals, elsewhere in hospitals. Um, basically, what are the, the practices that go along with the, the, the use of antimicrobials and how that might change or could be influenced in a way that would be beneficial? Do you want to get your slides no, up again? That's fine. Okay. Um, first, how do bacteria resist antibiotics? You could almost imagine them if you were asked a question, you could put it down on a paper. They destroy the drug, as they do for penicillins. They modify the drug, as they do with aminoglycoside. They modify the target of the drug. That would be a nice way to prevent the antibiotic from working. They pump the drug out of the cell before it ever gets inside of the bacterium to reach its target. So there's this panoply of resistance mechanisms which are out there. And why? Well, they weren't out there so that we can't treat infections. They were out there because bacteria are always meeting these products of their other bacteria in the environments. And so they've evolved with these mechanisms. And what is most interesting is that in the producers of antibiotics, which are largely soil bacteria, although we can get some from fungi, the, well, you could ask, why aren't these bacteria dying from the antibiotic that they're making, which we think is a secondary metabolite, if you know what it is, from another process. The answer is they have internal resistances, and those resistance mechanisms have, over the millennia, gotten out into other bacteria and helped them to survive. And finally, really in recent history, they've come into the kinds of bacteria that we're trying to treat. And I say that because some people mistakenly think that we are creating the resistance genes. We are creating the resistance traits. We're not. We're just recruiting them. By using all the antibiotics out there in animals, in plants and agriculture, as I mentioned, recklessly in people for colds and flus, or taking them one at a time instead of for the full dose, all of this, makes the environment filled with antibiotics of no use and you select out the kinds of bacteria that are going to be resistant. And really, when they looked at bacteria from the mid-1920s and 30s, they had the genetic mechanism for transferring bacteria uh, resistances. But the resistances weren't there. They've been recruited. They've been selected, so to speak, so that now they've evolved in bacteria that cause disease. Only now, interestingly enough, are we going back and looking at the 10 to the 28 bacteria that are out there in the soils and the waters. And we're finding, my gosh, all this resistance. No wonder we're having a problem. Because in fact, they've risen to the surface, so to speak. The antibiotics have helped. They've met up with bacteria like E. coli and Pseudomonas and Streptococcus, and they've delivered they are little packages of resistance genes, and the bacteria that we now face are resistant. So it's ecology of some means. It's survival of the fittest, certainly. But it is now almost late to think about the fact that we have overused these precious drugs. We created environments of resistance. We kind of don't want to do that with the new drugs we're inventing, and they're hard to come by. And I think that's one of the big issues that we're facing is, one, it's hard to find new antibiotics. In fact, as Linda did, there are very few new ones coming up, and there are fewer ones now. Two, uh, they're very expensive to bring to the market, and so companies are not interested in continuing to discover new antibiotics because the return isn't going to be there. It'll be too expensive or there are too few people taking them for too little time. It could be a lot of people taking it, but they might only take it for three or four days. Think of those people taking Lipitor for cholesterol or someone taking uh, drugs for cardiac disease or neurologic disease. They're daily chronic usage. So there's a 
there's a big gap now. We have a medical need because of all this resistance uh, aligned with mechanisms of resistance of all different types for all the antibiotics we currently have. And in most, if not all, the bacteria, they come together so that it's multiple. And we have that problem. And we have the industry that gave us all those antibiotics, those wonderful drugs that Linda was showing you. I mean, can you imagine? Over 100 different drugs in 15 different classes? My gosh, were they working hard. But none of them are working great anymore. So we're stuck looking for new ones. So that's kind of the situation. And we'll get into legislation perhaps later, but I think we need some help. Companies need help, whether they're big companies because they decide they're not going to make a billion dollar drug, or they're a small discovery company that needs investors in order to find the new antibiotic. But if the investor hears on the radio or reads in the paper, you know, antibiotics aren't money makers, <laughs> unfortunately, all the good in the world, they're not going to invest. So small companies are suffering and big companies are suffering. Fortunately, there are groups out there fighting this issue and I think we'll win, but we'll talk about it. Later? Okay. I was going to say, why don't we, you both sit up here now and because we're going to, from now on it'll be more um, back and forth and um, I'm going to give you the microphone to pass back and forth and I will try to yell. Um, but what I say is much less important than what you have to say, so it's better that you have the microphone. Okay. Um, but Linda, I wanted you to, to just follow up about mm -hmm. how is this perceived at FDA? What do you see happening in the industry? What are the things FDA is learning from this process of um, new drugs or and fewer new drugs or older drugs coming through? Um, just, just what's going on and, and, mm -hmm. and how you, you know, what response have you had so far? Okay. First of all, FDA takes a problem very seriously and we've over the years we've tried all sorts of things um, as Stuart said and as shown in this slide the pharmaceutical companies are quite upfront in telling us that they're not putting the money into research and development in antimicrobials they don't see short-term use of antimicrobials to in any way competes with these chronic diseases that they can you know make a whole lot more money on um, there's also an FDA aspect to this, which for truth and advertisement I have to get into. Um, we, we, it, we have had a number of workshops specifically devoted to how do we encourage the development of antimicrobials. They've been good. They've been in conjunction with the Infectious Diseases Society of America, IDSA, and with Pharma, which is a um, trade group of the pharmaceutical companies and bio, which is the smaller, uh, well, the, the biotech industry, which, which seems to have more interest in looking at some of these products, or, or at any event, um, developing, developing them to the point where maybe a big pharmaceutical company could come pick them up and buy them you know, from the company. So we've tried, we've asked them outright, what can we do? Well, one of the issues is that how we review the data that comes from a clinical trial that's looking at an antimicrobial has changed over the years. And the reason for that is there's new scientific knowledge. Normally, you probably all are aware of the term placebo-controlled um, clinical trial. You don't do that with infectious diseases when you have a, some existing antimicrobial agent. So it's an active control clinical trial where one group of people takes the current therapy and the other group blinded. We, we don't know who they are. The other group takes the new drug. What we, in that kind of a clinical trial design, it gets a little bit difficult. It's harder to show an effect of a new antimicrobial to an old one than it is for a new drug to a placebo. So there are two types of study. One is called a superiority study, where you're actually showing that that second drug is better than the first, is more effective and safer or whatever. The second kind is called a non-inferiority trial, which means that you're trying to show that the second drug is as good as the first drug within a certain margin, a statistical margin, so that we can 
prove it. Well, in the earlier days, FDA was was sort of misguided in what they were telling people to do because we didn't know. <laughs> and so there may be drugs out there that we inadvertently approve that are less than um, fully effective, I guess is the word. It, you know, if you, you don't want to approve drugs that are marginally effective. What you do in that situation is you create, create more resistance. So we've been trying in recent years to develop guidance. This is a euphemism for how we tell industry what we're looking for in their submissions to the FDA. And the industry has naturally complained, you're moving the target. You know, so we've we've gotten, as Stuart said, there are a lot of groups out there that are trying to help both FDA figure out how to go about doing this and to help um, encourage companies to look at it. Another big area is to look at the issue of incentives, tax breaks, all kinds of things. Again, we've had a number of meetings. I can go into a lot of detail if you have specific questions. Um, it, if it's working, it's working slowly. I guess it's a good way to answer that question. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to follow up a, a little bit on that one. Okay. Let's take that. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that, that you point out is, is that it clearly is difficult to provide incentives um, to get industry to develop, to develop these drugs. Um, one of the other complications is that when you develop a new drug, the first thing you tell people is, now don't use it, because we don't want to start generating more resistance to this drug. So, I mean, that's the last thing a pharmaceutical company wants to hear. They've invested a billion dollars, they've developed a new drug, don't sell it and discourage everybody from using it. Let's just put it in the back so we have it in case of an emergency. Well, you know, that's a deal killer for a lot of them. Um, so I wanted to get, um, to just follow up a little bit on, um, more on the practices. Um, one of the things I read, and this may or may not be accurate, that in um, um, Sweden, the s only 2% of the staff are multidrug resistant because it's a much more tightly controlled system. They have a lot more control over what doctors are allowed to prescribe and uh, the regimes that they apply in treating patients. Um, we, and whereas in the United States, the number is up to 60% of the staff are multi-drug resistant. So it's, it seems obvious that the practices you use can make an enormous difference. And recognizing how difficult it's going to be to develop new drugs, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what we could do with practices that would allow us to get more mileage um, out of the drugs we have. And even if it's possible to, to back off, I understand with a good regime, some hospitals have been able to say, to go from 60% multidrug resistant um, resistance in their hospitals to 30% or 20%. So is, is that so? And if it is, how might we be able to do that? Well, it really illustrates the, what I call the drug resistance equation. I think in Sweden, the amounts of antibiotics being used is the least of all of Europe, and there's a gradient that starts with northern Europe and goes all the way down to the Mediterranean. As you get further south, there's more and more antibiotic and more and more resistance. So, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. The other is uh, hygiene and uh, illness control. Uh, and to make sure that you do not have, besides the selection of the bacteria, the spread of the bacteria from one person to another. So in hospitals, we have infection control people. In the homes, we want people to wash their hands, we want people to wash the meats and all to avoid the sickness they could get. Um, and I think that this is really one of the things one can do instead of relying on antibiotics. Uh, this came home to me clearly in meetings with surgeons who found that not having an antibiotic available in case there was an infection was almost a new paradigm. You mean my patient come down with an infection you can't treat it? Because in fact as years went on every infection that would occur in the hospital would be treatable and so there was a kind of a lax. I'm not going to say that it was all over, but I think there was an attitude there that we don't need to worry. And that is also true of the public. Remember, some of you uh, remember maybe grandparents and, uh, or great-grandparents and what all, certainly, that had you washing your hands before you 
went and had food. Well, that doesn't happen very much. I can remember in school, we had to go wash our hands before lunch at my public school. We don't do it much here. And in fact, my biggest peeve is lunch. I mean, if you really want to observe the hand washing, uh, I'd say stick to lunch. Because in breakfast, you're getting up, you haven't met other people. Dinner, you'll always come home and get washed. But lunch, you're at all these meetings, you're shaking hands, you're <laughs> moving bacteria around. Nobody says, oh, well, will you mind? I, I, I can't, I want to go wash my hands. You know, people <laughs> say, are you one of those? Yeah, okay. So I think hygiene and prudent use really come together. And I think we have to do more of that. And there's also a movement afoot to invent antibiotics that don't necessarily kill the bacterium, but prevent the bacterium from making infections. And you can do that. It has to turn on a group of, of traits that allow it to cause the infection in the lung, in the urinary tract, and so forth. And you can stop that bacterium from making the infection and let the body take care of getting rid of the organism. So I think that, that approach does not generate resistance because the bacteria are not threatened for their life. They can grow wonderfully, and especially in the environment, but they don't cause the infection. So um, I just want to say quickly, um, it, I should point out that when Dr. Levy talks about the mechanisms of developing resistance and some of these new approaches, that he's not talking about what he read in the journals. He's talking about some of his own work. <laughs> um, so we should give him credit. He, you know, for instance, that the pump mechanism by which they, re they reject some of the, his work that, that occurred in his lab. So um, we know it personally. Yes. Yes. We have a um, just quickly, I think I are going to turn to the, the audience, but I want to quickly get each of you to respond to commercial products that are available, um, antibacterials, soaps, washes, sprays that we sing around, are they, how good are they? For, and is, does FDA look at them at all? And what do you think about them? Well, I, I look at them amusingly. If we could get the end of my talk, I, I thought I'd show a couple examples here. Okay, for, we'll we'll get it up later right. after some of the questions. But we'll I, get back um, to it. The bottom line is uh, that the antibacterial products, the chemicals that are put into household products with the idea that is going to give you that extra security against bacterial infections, do not do that. And studies uh, from Elaine Larson's group at Columbia demonstrate clearly that whether you use soap with or without an antibacterial, you get the same result. There is no improvement in the numbers of illnesses in your home, so why pay the extra money? And worse than that, my laboratory has shown that these products select hello, for antibiotic, not only resistance to themselves, but also to antibiotics. So you get a double problem. So why bother with them? So the only positive thing that's come out of it is that the advertising of the antibacterial in the soap gets people to at least think about soap again. So uh, maybe they'll start washing their hands and then we'll tell them to use not to use antibacterial, you know, sort of two steps. One step forward, or two steps forward and one step back. Okay, well we can call it antibacterial. We don't control the advertising of products anyway, we'll just ban this stuff. <laughs> now, so regular soap, but you can pay extra, and we'll call it antimicrobial. Um, questions? Anyone here? Norman. Would you care to comment on uh, Paul Farmer's success with multi drug resistant bacteria and how, how he has done that? First, you have to be Paul Farmer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Second of all, uh, yeah. For you, those of you who don't know, Paul Farmer is a physician from Harvard who is the founder of um, Partners in Health. Partners in Health. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, he'll explain I, I the experiment that he did. Issues. I, I think it can be done. It was, you know, there's, what it is is you direct the therapy. You make sure the patient continues on the therapy and doesn't have a break because of the resistance problem. The second aspect of his work is that you look at these extremely resistant to TB uh, patients and you don't give up on them. You take combinations of other drugs and you give it to them and you actually keep them in your view. And they, you do it and does the community. So it's a community effort. Interestingly enough, the treatment of sexually transmitted diseases, 
I should say particularly gonorrhea, follows the same principle. A patient comes into a sexually transmitted disease clinic and has syphilis or gonorrhea. You are not, you're going to treat the patient for that with an antibiotic. You can't give that patient a five-day course or a seven-day course. Forget it. The patient isn't going to adhere to it. You have to give them one therapy that day. And that limits the kinds of antibiotics you can use for the organism causing gonorrhea because it has to be looked at. It's directed therapy. I think this is the, the first instance of directed therapy working because if you don't see the patient down the four tetracyclines or the three ciprofloxacins or get the injection of, uh, you don't get a cure. And today, because of all the use of antibiotics for other reasons, the organism is now resistant to penicillin and tetracyclines and quinolones and spectinomycin. So you're left with the second generation cephalosporins and we hope to still have them. Why? We can't use every antibiotic because you can only use, it can be, it has to be a one treatment uh, success. So I'd like to share that because there are those instances where too little drug leads to resistance, not just too much. But, Stuart, the, the concept of the combination therapy is being talked um, about in using against anti-infectives, not just HIV and, and so on, and that it's the existing antimicrobials that we have out there, can they be combined in some way against some of these more virulent infections, community-acquired pneumonia or MRSA and so on, and look at that approach. Do you know what yeah, people do yeah. that? Okay. In cancer, it's very common, in fact, it's more than common, to use more than one drug because of resistance. For HIV, it's more than one drug. For TB, it's the only bacterial diseases in which multiple drugs were used, isoniazid, rifampicin, streptomycin. It was common. Why? Because resistance emergence was so common to the single drug. Now the thought comes up, well, then why are we worrying about resistance? We'll just give them two or three antibiotics and combination will work. Well, the problem is, that one, most, many of the organisms are resistant to all the drugs there, so which ones are you going to use? Secondly, they have to get to the bacteria at the same time, otherwise it's just single therapy because they get this drug and then an hour later they get another drug. So it's, you know, there's an art to getting all three or four drugs to the place at the same time. And finally, what makes it very frustrating for us in the clinical side is a patient comes down with hives. They're on penicillin, you stop the penicillin. But suppose you've now used the three most effective antibiotics for this disease patient and the patient has an allergy. Which drug is it? You have to stop them all, so you got nothing. So in infectious diseases, we have been very pleased and lucky that bacteria will succumb to a single antibiotic. So we'd like not to have to use more than one drug. Other questions? Yes. So there's some sense that if you're if a bacterium becomes resistant to two or three drugs, uh, there's a price that it has to pay in terms of fitness. That mm -hmm. if it had to be resistant to five or six, it just wouldn't be able to sort of make that happen and still be able to reproduce and vary that sort of thing. If you had enough combination, that is a theory. But what we've seen is that it's not a very big price because they seem to adapt very well. And probably what's going on is that huge numbers of bacteria that are out there. So that if they're carrying eight resistant, well, the other issue is they have cassettes and plasmids where they can carry all these genes. So they can, they have a very efficient use of their DNA. But that has been brought up over and over again, and we've never seen any evidence that it costs them so much that they're going to drop off their resistance genes, unfortunately. It's a good theory, but it... It, it, it did make sense until we note that methicillin resistant staph aureus is not multi-drug resistant, four, five, six drugs, E. coli, seven or eight drugs, and they're doing a great job out there. They're living, they're doing fine, they're causing infections. So, 
it was also said, what are you worrying about resistance for? They're never going to be able to cause infections. I can remember that when we were talking about the problem of resistance emergence in intestinal bacteria, they said, oh, that's just gut flora. What are you worrying about? I'm talking about really important bacteria like Haemophilus for pneumonias and pneumococcus. They'll never be resistant. Are you kidding now? They're multi-drug resistant. Just, so it disproves, although it makes some sense. And in fact, in the laboratory, the first mutants weren't working terribly well. But that doesn't mean that with complete and continued onslaught, the, there are compensatory mutations in the organism which make it now an infectious organism. And I think the answer is what Linda said. We can postulate all we want, but let's look at the list that's there for multidrug resistance. There isn't anyone excluded. They all can do it. 